It's Thursday, April 4. In the headlines, Jamaica Teachers Association wants improvement in the procurement process for school resources. Parish Hilton supporting abused boys who are citizens from the United States housed here in Jamaica. In business news, dollar financial leaving Guyana despite profits. Regionally, agriculture digitalization, key focus of Caribbean Investment Forum 2024. And in sports, an update on ticket sales for men's ICC T20 World Cup. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. Media personality and a prominent children's rights advocate from the United States, Paris Hilton, is calling on the U.S. government to do more to protect children with human rights and children's rights issues. Ms. Hilton was speaking at a press conference in St. Elizabeth, Jamaica on Wednesday. Her comments came due to allegations of abuse made by eight American boys rescued from American-operated Atlantis Leadership Academy in St. Elizabeth by the Child Protection and Family Services Agency, CPFSA. I heard these boys were stripped naked, violently beaten, whipped, and waterboarded. The staff would take a cup of bleach and salt and rub it into the child's wounds to torture them. Imagine someone doing this to your child. It makes me sick. It should be noted that the facility was operated, staffed, and run by Americans. The CPFSA last week disclosed that it intervened to ensure the safety of the boys aged 14 to 18 following an unannounced visit to the facility on February 8th, along with representatives from the U.S. Embassy in Kingston. Ms. Hilton argued that the children were sent to Jamaica only to be exposed to a life of abuse and isolation and forced to kneel on metal bottle caps for hours. Another child alleges he was placed in isolation called the box at this facility and was beaten with a cord. Boys also said they were forced to fight one another for the entertainment of the staff. On top of this, these boys claim they were physically restrained and starved for months at a time. There is nothing these children could have done to deserve this torture. When I was notified of the unfolding situation, I knew I needed to take action. A team of U.S.-based attorneys representing the abused boys accompanied Hilton to a court hearing, including a survivor who escaped a life of abuse while staying at Tranquility Bay, also in St. Elizabeth, more than two decades ago. There is nowhere that a facility can hide where we cannot find them. We will not allow children to carry the shame and stigma of abuse alone. That belongs solely to the abusers. Atlantis Leadership Academy is a perfect example of the risks involved in placing youth abroad. Parents who trusted this facility have temporarily lost custody of their children. Rightfully, Jamaican authorities are questioning why anyone would be willing to sign over guardianship of their child to a complete stranger. She says she is dedicated to eliminating child abuse and neglect in youth residential programs. Ms. Hilton is working with authorities to get the abused boys back to the United States. Following comments from Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark in the opening of the 2024-2025 budget debate in the House of Representatives last month about several changes coming to improve Jamaica's procurement system, the Jamaica Teachers Association, JTA, wants the government to quickly improve the process to provide resources to schools in a timely manner. More in this report from Danita Rodney. Jamaica Teachers Association President Leighton Johnson is once again calling on the government to act quickly on promises made. The JTA president says the current challenges with the procurement process are having a negative effect on the ability of school administrators to do their jobs. When you hear the minister speak, she will indicate that um, resources or the, the allocation is there. Mm -hmm. But then there, there are always challenges with the procurement process. The procurement process is a process that spins very slowly. 
slowly and we we constantly indicate that you know we have to move from that point because whilst the wheels of the ministry are grinding slowly there are students and teachers who are suffering because of what we or what appears to be the non-response President Johnson is also calling on the Education Ministry to revisit the service level agreement approach that was once utilized in order for administrators to undertake emergency work and small projects at schools. Whatever emergency work, emergency work for the purchasing of uh, uh, equipment, technological equipment that is essential for the operations of teaching and learning, infrastructural developments, the school from their, from their level can be funded mm. and they will go through their low level procurement. They, will, they know the artisans in the community. They know those persons who will do good work in the community. They have developed relationships with many vendors um, that can um, assist them in the acquisition of uh, up to date um, minimum standards or high spec technology. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Danita Rodney. Property owners are being advised that they should pay their property taxes by April 30. The Tax Administration Jamaica, TAJ, is advising property owners that its system is now updated to reflect property tax liabilities for the 2024-2025 period. Persons are being advised that they can pay the tax amounts online via tax portal at www.jamaicatax.gov.jm without the possibility of any penalty being applied, using a wide range of alternative payment options instead of visiting a tax office. Property owners also have the added convenience of the TAJ mobile app. According to the TAJ, the app allows users to conduct several property tax-related transactions, including payments, search for property details by valuation and strata numbers, view and share your payment history. In addition, TAJ clients of Scotia Bank can also make payments using Scotia online or mobile app, and national commercial bank clients are able to pay their property taxes via their bank's online platform by adding Tax Administration Jamaica as a payee. Clerk to the Houses of Parliament, Mrs. Valerie Curtis, is set to retire on April 6, 2024. Gordon House, in a release, explained that Ms. Curtis, quote, reached the age of retirement in April 2021 and having been granted an extension of an additional two years to expire upon reaching the age of 67 years, end quote. In the business report, Dollar Financial Services Limited will be winding up operations in Guyana after just two and a half years. The PBCJ understands that this is due to the geopolitical instability caused by Venezuela's claim on the Essequibo region of Guyana. The revelation on Dollar Guyana Inc. came out in the company's 2023 audited financials, which were released on Tuesday on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. The note stated the decision is due to the current geopolitical uncertainty and the reallocation of resources to Jamaica where returns exceed those in Guyana. Dollar Guyana was formed in August 2021 with Dollar Financial Services injecting $31.18 million to form the business and was funded by a U.S. $1 million loan. Dollar Guyana brought in an $8.41 million interest income and had an asset base of $163.08 million by the end of 2021. According to the statement, the resources will be reallocated to Jamaica and the process should be completed by March 2025 when all loans are fully repaid. This decision was decided on February 5 by Dollar's Board of Directors. Mailpack Group Limited says the transaction documents for the acquisition of MyCart Express were finalized and the acquisition was completed on April 1, 2024. The Mailpack Group Limited for the year ended December 31, 2023 reported a 1% decrease in revenue totaling $1.67 billion compared to $1.69 billion in the corresponding period last year.
Management noted in a release, quote, this rise can be attributed to strategic investment in the growth of the business, including increased marketing, the rental of new locations and investments in entering the broader price conscious market segment, end quote. Net profit for the year amounted to $260.14 million, a 16% decrease from $308.04 million reported in 2022. Honeybun Limited has made a billion dollar investment in a new production facility in Angel St. Catherine, which is set to more than double the manufacturing capacity. Greater production of baked goods is expected with the signing of the long-term lease agreement for the 160,000 square foot mega facility owned by MJS Industrial Park. Deputy CEO Daniel Chung said that the new long-term lease of the new four-and-a-half-acre property, which will be operational in the next seven to ten months, will initially see Honeybun moving half of its operation from its current retirement crescent property in Kingston. The head office of the bakery company will remain at Retirement Crescent in Kingston and will continue to supply Kingston and St. Andrew, St. Thomas, Portland and St. Mary. The new Angels facility will service the rest of the island. In regional business, the Trinidad and Tobago National Petroleum Marketing Company Limited MP said there is no pricing mechanism yet for electric vehicle charging stations, but it's hopeful it will be on the agenda. Speaking during a public accounts committee, NP's chairman, Saheed Hussein, said it's within the remit of NGC CNG to provide fuel stations with electricity and charging ports through the use of solar energy. He said at NP stations, only one charging station exists at NP Presal, but is not monetized at this time. Stations under our remit that has a charging facility, but it's something we're looking at. Because part of the issue is that there's no pricing mechanism for engaging in uh, the execution of those charging ports at the station. So that, that is a policy matter that has to be developed firstly. And then based on the policy that's developed, um, whether it's going to be free, and is required to you know, um, pursue that. But at this point, um, as far as I'm aware, that's within the remit of NGC, CNG. Meanwhile, General Manager of Retail and Industrial Fuels, Angelique Phillip, said NP continues to work with NGC CNG to continuously look, look at alternative NP service station sites across the country to expand the use of CNG. The, the distance of these um, locations from NGC's um, line supply but we have been working with um, NGC CNG with respect to alternatives to direct connection to line supply. And for example, at the New Mayara station, we're looking towards um, a, a standalone model that we will be able to supply CNG to the south um, eastern part of the country. So it is, a, it is a factor. It is one of the things that we look for in the new to industry sites. Up next, news on the local and regional stock exchange and the forex trade with Denise Williams. During trading on April 3, 2024, the top three advancing stocks covered the finance and manufacturing sectors on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. ISP Finance Services Limited shares advanced by 16.19% for a $4.32 price increase to close at $31 with 17 shares traded. Cigna's Credit Investments Limited US dollar shares advanced by 13.96% for a one cent price increase to close at US 8 cents with 1,120 shares traded. Paramount Trading Jamaica Limited shares advanced 13.74% for an 18 cent price increase to close at $1.49 with 2,039 shares traded. On the declining stocks that traders experienced on April 3, 2024, the top three losers covered the health, finance, and transportation sectors. G West Corporation Limited declined by 16.54% for a 21 cent price drop to close at $1.00 and six cents with 14,700 shares traded. Jamaica Money Market Brokers Group Limited 7.25% cumulative shares declined by 10% for 
for a 19 cent price decrease to close at $1.71 with 226,614 shares traded. Trans Jamaican Highway Limited US dollar shares declined by 9.87% to close at 2 cents with 511,536 shares traded. Over on the Twin Island Republic of Trinidad and Tobago Stock Exchange, trading on April 3, 2024, registered a volume of 233,265 shares, crossing the floor of the exchange, valued at TT $1,533,070.87. JMMB Group Limited was the volume leader, with 76,833 shares changing hands, for a value of TT $116,017.83, followed by First Caribbean International Bank Limited with a volume of 53,074 shares being traded for TT $373,846.70. Moving from the money moves of investors, executives, and companies, we turn to the Forex market. On April 3, 2024, the Bank of Jamaica reported that US 26.6 million was bought from Forex traders, while US 18.5 million was sold to Forex traders. Buying directly from the Bank of Jamaica, foreign currency traders sold the US dollar for $155.08 and bought the US dollar for $152.33. The difference between the buy and sell rate was $2.75, which represents a profit for Forex traders for every US dollar traded. Canadian Forex traders earned a trading profit of $6.55 from transactions with the Bank of Jamaica. The Canadian dollar was sold at $115.90 and bought for $109.35. For traders looking at the British pound, they pocketed a profit of $4.08, selling it for $194.92, and buying it for $190.84. For the credit report tip of the day, if you face challenges borrowing to meet everyday needs in a low wage scenario, we have another suggestion for this credit report tip of the day. Focus on your credit utilization optimization, a fancy phrase that speaks to how often and by how much you use your loans and credit cards. Keep a keen eye on your credit utilization ratio, which means you should not spend more than 30% of your available credit across all accounts. By maintaining a low utilization rate, you'll demonstrate responsible credit management, positively impacting your credit report and score over time. And with that, we wrap up today's business report. I'm Denise Williams. Thanks, Denise. In regional news, in Guyana, with rapid transformation ongoing and a key focus on collectively building economic resilience in the region, the 2024 Caribbean Investment Forum was on Wednesday launched to talk about placing priority on building partnerships and attracting investors in key non-oil sectors. This year's Caribbean Investment Forum will focus on three investment sectors, sustainable agriculture, green economy transition, and digitization of businesses. It was launched on Wednesday at the Marriott Hotel in Georgetown. The forum is expected to attract more than 500 investors from across the region. Delivering the feature address at the launch, Minister of Tourism, Industry and Commerce, Unij Waldron, said the forum will provide the platform to foster economic resilience and will enable the region to to recover and possibly withstand external shocks and natural disasters. She reminded that the region is one that is in search of food security and sustainable agriculture production is an area of high priority. Our region needs investment in renewable energy for energy security to reduce our current dependence on fossil fluids, fuels and to survive the inevitable global transition from them. Thus, investments in solar, wind, and hydropower across the region, as well as geothermal energy, where feasible, are particularly important. All of these in, in, in initiatives call for innovative approaches. We must innovate to meet the unique challenges that face us as a region. As a region, 
We are interested in true partnerships with those who seek to become invested in our communities in much more than the financial sense. We wish to attract the investor who is committed to the sustainable development of the countries and communities within which he or she operates and from which they derive value. Executive Director of Caribbean Export Development Agency Diodat Maharaj said the Caribbean should also be a place for trade and investment like other parts of the world. We have created a unique platform for business, to engage with business, to create business. In other words, less talk, more business. And therefore, we have a forensic focus on getting the right people at the table. The Caribbean Investment Forum 2024 is slated for July 10 to the 12 at the Artichung Conference Center under the theme Transforming Futures, Empowering Growth. Reporting for the newsroom, Sharda Bacchus. Over the weekend, 20 Coast Guard officers and 31 Belize Defense Force soldiers arrived in Jamaica to participate in Exercise Trojan Shield. This brings together service members from Jamaica, the Bahamas and now Belize as they integrate into a CARICOM Joint Task Force. The exercise primarily focuses on training, planning and executing a variety of scenario-driven security activities. A release from the Canadian Defence Ministry indicates that approximately 70 Canadian Armed Force members have been deployed to Jamaica. Their mission is to provide training and military personnel from CARICOM nations who are preparing to deploy to Haiti as part of the United Nations authorized Kenyan-led multinational security support mission. News 5 Belize spoke to the commandant of the Belize Coast Guard, Rear Admiral Elton Bennett. Um, this training that we are currently undergoing is actually the second phase of training. Uh, we started to train along with the Canadian military in January of this year. And the, the same, very same team that is currently over in Jamaica did our one-week uh, training here in Belize where the Canadian military came in country to do an introduction to what peacekeeping operations under the United Nations umbrella really looks like. Um, so they looked at um, issues such as um, human, international humanitarian law, um, use of force policy, and so forth. Uh, so now we are moving over into Jamaica to do um, more operational training along with those other countries that will form a part of the Joint Task Force um, in preparation for a possible deployment into Haiti. So they will be there for four weeks and they would do operation operational training um, that will prepare them for um, the different scenarios in Haiti. Uh, we, we do understand um, and appreciate the level of risk um, that they will be taken into Haiti. Um, therefore, this this training is very, very crucial uh, to prepare these men uh, for that possible deployment. Um, so you're looking at uh, peacekeeping and stability operational um, serials, um, what to do in certain events, um, looking at um, use of force policy, and to ensure the men are, are best prepared uh, to go into that, that very high-risk um, environment. One of the expectations is that the SIDS 4 conference will pave the way for the increased investment in small island developing states. So says Antigua and Barbuda's permanent representative to the United Nations, Tamasi Blair. Ursil Charles Jr. reports. Foreign direct investment is critical to buttress development of emerging markets. And SIDS 4 will seek as one of its major policy outcomes to unearth new investment opportunities for small island developing states and ensure investment fears are allayed. Antigua Barbuda's Deputy Permanent Representative to the United Nations, Tomasi Blair, explains. There is this, this conversation that happens worldwide that SIDS are not perhaps investment worthy because of our vulnerabilities to climate change um, and, and, and our novel resource basins and so forth. And so we want to ensure that we prepare SIDS um, for an investment climate. He underscores the importance of foreign direct investment for sustainability. We understand and, and we're determined that coming out of this 10-year framework that the private sector um, along with our development partners will be ready to assist SIDS. So we have to ensure that we have this climate of investment um, uh, prepared uh, for our countries um, to, to move forward in our sustainable development uh, plans. The Investment Forum will form part of the Centre of Excellence to be established in this country post SIDS 4. Blair hopes there will be recognition of the immense investment opportunities available in the islands, despite their vulnerabilities. We have to change the narrative that because our islands are so vulnerable to climate change and environmental hazards and ex external um, economic shocks, 
that our that we're not investment worthy. And so we're changing that narrative. We're showing opportunities where you can actually invest um, in the islands. And you know, we're all acutely aware that there's this push for sustainable investment, and and the islands provide that that right opportunity. In addition to the Island Investment Forum, the Centre of Excellence will also feature a data hub and an innovation and technology mechanism. For ABS News, I am Ursil Charles Jr. In sports, we have an update on ticket sales for the fast-approaching men's ICC T20 World Cup. Speaking at the LOC press conference, Head of PR and Communications for the World Cup, Damon Leon provided an update on party standard tickets as well as general entry as some games are almost Canada. sold out. Party stand tickets are actually going to go on sale from the middle of this month. We're also getting a lot of questions about what about box offices across the Caribbean. That also is going to come on train for the tournament. That's going to happen close to the tournament time. That being said, we want to encourage everyone that even though we're going to have box offices, that a lot of people are purchasing the tickets on the website right now. And if you wait, the chances are that when the box office is open, there will be a limited supply. So we encourage everyone that if there are games, I checked on the website just um, before coming up, there are still tickets here for the semi-final that is coming up in Trinidad. Um, from what I've seen, um, the semi-final in Guyana, I think tickets are currently unavailable. Um, of course, the final tickets are currently unavailable. Um, but that does not mean that tickets may not come back on sale. So we encourage everyone to continue looking out for that. Meanwhile, Assistant Commissioner of Police Kelvin Thompson confirmed that parking for patrons at the Brian Lowry Cricket Academy will not be allowed. So, as far as traffic goes, we have a traffic plan being developed. It is all keyed along security, one, and two, what is the final determination as far as what is required by the ICC overall security plan. So, park and ride, yes, in terms of coming directly to the stadium, no, that much I could tell you definitely. There will be a shuttle system to facilitate persons getting there safely and security for the vehicles. And that's the news on PBCJ. Thanks for watching.